Number 1. Andrew resided in a mobile home on Richards Avenue in Webster, Massachusetts. He played in the woods behind nearby Ash Street Trailer Park with his seven-year-old sister and their six-year-old cousin during the morning hours of September 30, 1978. Andrew and his cousin went deeper into the woods without his sister. Then Andrew stumbled and injured himself, dropped and lost his favorite toy, then began crying and running in circles. He refused to leave without the toy. His cousin told him to stay put and walked back to the family's home for assistance at approximately 10.30 a.m., but Andrew disappeared by the time they returned to the woods. He has never been heard from again. An extensive search of the area, which lasted 10 days and included the National Guard, produced no clues as to Andrew's whereabouts. He and his sister and cousin had been forbidden to play in the woods and had sneaked there on the day of his disappearance. Andrew disappeared only 50 yards away from Route 52, which is now Interstate 395. Some people theorized that he wandered over to the road and was picked up by a motorist passing through. Webster, Massachusetts is on the Connecticut border and also only a 10 to 15 minute drive from Rhode Island. Authorities excavated a wooded area off of Minebrook Road in June 1998, nearly 20 years after Andrew disappeared. Investigators learned that evidence related to his case may have buried in the forest, which was approximately five miles from the location of Andrew's disappearance. The search failed to produce any materials connected to his case. Officials discovered a handwritten list of names entitled Lake Webster in Nathaniel Bar Jonah's possessions in Montana in December 2001. A photo of Bar Jonah is posted with this case summary. Bar Jonah, whose given name was David P. Brown, was raised in Dudley, Massachusetts. He was convicted of the abductions and attempted murders of two Massachusetts boys in 1977. Bar Jonah was also charged with the 1996 murder of Zachary Ramsey in Montana, but the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence in October 2002. Zachary's remains have never been located. Bar Jonah was named as a possible suspect in the 1973 Connecticut disappearance of Janice Pocket and the 1997 disappearance of Amanda Galleon from Wyoming. He has never been charged in connection with either of the cases. Bar Jonah was convicted of child molestation in Montana in February 2002. He died of a blood clot in a Montana prison in April 2008, at age 51. Investigators began pursuing another lead in Andrew's case in November 2003. A man, whose identity has not been released, confessed to his murder in 1999. He died of lung cancer shortly thereafter. His family did not report it to the police for four years. Authorities excavated a rural area near Burrillville, Rhode Island, as specified in the confession, but they didn't find anything of interest. Some news reports stated that Andrew's name was on the Lake Webster list, but these accounts were incorrect, and nobody has been able to tie Bar Jonah to Andrew. Foul play is suspected in Andrew's case. Number 2 Judith resided in Chelmsford, Massachusetts in 1982. On the night of June 5, she attended a party in Balearica, Massachusetts with her fiancé of a four months. They had an argument during their stay, and Judith drove her fiancé to his home, then continued back to the party by herself. Witnesses told investigators that she left the party alone at approximately 2 a.m., neither Judith nor the black 1972 or 1977 Dodge Dart she was driving have been located since that time. Investigators with the Chelmsford Police Department received a tip from the U.S. Secret Service in Washington, D.C., who were investigating a counterfeiting operation. One of the ring's suspects, James Mitchell Deber Delibin, was also believed to be connected to a number of murders. Secret Service agents found a map of the Chelmsford region in the suspect's car, along with several photos of women involved in sadomasochistic acts. A receipt from a local motel in Chelmsford in the car, it was dated June 4, 1982, the day prior to Judith's disappearance. It is known that Deborah Delibin liked brunettes, which fits Judith's profile, and he knew some of the people who attended the party in Balearica the night of Judith's disappearance. Chelmsford police detectives attempted to work with Deborah Delibin regarding Judith's case, but leads never panned out, and he denied having ever met her. It is worth noting that Deborah Delibin was ruled out as a suspect in the 1982 Michigan disappearance of Kelly Brownlee. Judith was employed at a fast food restaurant in Chelmsford at the time of her 1982 disappearance. Her mother told authorities that Judith was being harassed by a male co-worker at the time she vanished. Judith's mother also stated that her daughter was frightened of the employee. It is not known if the unidentified male is connected to Judith's disappearance. Her brother Joe stated she was going through a rebellious phase in 1982 and may have gotten involved in criminal activity. 
The day before she disappeared, Judith asked her father to look in the trunk of her car, saying she was too frightened to do it herself. Joe believes she may have become a drug mule, perhaps unknowingly. After she went missing, an unidentified female called the Chartier home to say she knew what happened to Judith, but couldn't say anything more because someone had threatened her life. Judith's family believes she met with foul play at the hands of someone she knew. She has seven brothers and was particularly close to Joe. Joe never thought she ran away, saying she was too close to mother to do that. He believes someone at the party she went to that night knows what happened to her. Joe describes his sister as a sweet, gentle person who loved animals. Judith's parents are now both deceased. Her case remains open and unsolved. Number 3 Jesus was last seen at about 6 p.m. on September 28, 1996, walking with a nine-year-old male friend on Park Street in the Commons area of Lynn, Massachusetts, near his family's residence. Jesus was pushing his pink Huffy bicycle, which had two flat tires at the time. He was on his way home after playing in Bennett Circle. Jesus's friend told authorities that they were approached by an unidentified Caucasian man in his 20s or 30s with shoulder-length black hair. The man was walking with a shepherd collie dog with one white eye and one brown eye. His friend said the individual lured Jesus away by promising him a new bicycle. Jesus never returned home and has not been seen again. He attended Connery Elementary School at the time of his disappearance. Authorities identified the man as Robert C. Levesque, 26, shortly after Jesus vanished. Levesque's apartment was searched and investigators discovered duct tape and handcuffs. It is not known if the items were related to Jesus's case. Levesque lived just around the corner from Jesus's home in 1996. He owned a dog matching the description of the alleged abductor's animal in 1996, and his dog, named Peaches, was found at one of the seven addresses he had given his recent residences. He called in sick at his job the evening of Jesus's disappearance and was arrested after Jesus vanished. Levesque was charged with a parole violation, motor vehicle offenses, and possession of stolen property in mid-October 1996. He has never been charged in connection with Jesus's disappearance. The Massachusetts Department of Social Services, DSS, accused Jesus's mother, Magdalena Rodriguez, some agencies refer to her as Magdalena Ramirez, of neglect in the weeks following her son's disappearance. The agency said that Rodriguez did not report Jesus as a missing child until midnight on September 28, six hours after his apparent abduction. Others speculated that Jesus was abducted as the result of theorized drug use by his family members. Rodriguez denied any wrongdoing in Jesus's case and maintained that the claims were the result of racism against Hispanic individuals. Various rumors concerning Jesus's case circulated after his disappearance. Some people claimed that he had been taken to Puerto Rico, New York City, or the Dominican Republic as part of a deal to keep Rodriguez out of unspecified trouble. She has denied the allegations. Rodriguez has been interviewed by the police regarding her son's disappearance and says she is not concealing any knowledge connected to his case. She has since moved to another part of Massachusetts. Jesus's father, Juan de la Cruz, had been accused of abusing his son and threatening to abduct him from Rodriguez's custody prior to Jesus's disappearance. Authorities stated that Juan was at home at the time his son went missing, however. Juan has never been charged in connection with Jesus's case and maintains contact with the police handling the investigation. There have been many possible sightings of Jesus around the country in the years after his disappearance, but none of the sightings have been confirmed. Jesus has never been located and his disappearance remains unsolved. Number 4 John Mixon recalls that on the night of August 8, 1974, his 17-year-old girlfriend, Rhonda Lab, left her mother's home in Lawrence and began to hitchhike back to their apartment in Lowell, something she had done many times before. But Lab, a Balearica native, never made it home that night or the next day. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and months have turned into decades. With the 46th anniversary of Lab's disappearance on Friday, Balearica police are trying to jog some old memories to see if someone might have information from the day the teen went missing or her whereabouts. Lab left behind her paycheck from her job at Paris Shoes, her clothes and a big mystery. Mixon, now 68 and a developer in Maine, said he never forgot Lab, a fun-loving, beautiful girl, who was much older than her years. It still haunts me, Mixon said. I would love an answer to what happened to her. Police investigated for about a year, but little information ever came up. More recently, the Balearica Police Department made contact with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NCMEC, said Balearica Police Sergeant William West. 
NCMEC subsequently entered Susan Ronda Lab into its records system and has assisted with the follow-up investigation, including with DNA acquisition from family members and with age progression imaging, he said. Lab would be 64 on October 3. Based on information gathered from police investigation, Lab was living at 15 Sydney Street in Lowell, with Mixon, her brother, Ricky, and a couple of their friends. That evening, while Mixon and the others planned on going to a hockey game, Lab made arrangements to eat dinner with her mother, Louise, at her home in Lawrence. Mixon drove her to her mother's house and dropped her off at about 6 p.m. The last thing Lab said to Mixon, still haunts him, take care of Ricky for me. Mixon said he never got a chance to have her explain. At the apartment were Lab's mother, her mother's boyfriend and 11-year-old sister, Linda. When Lab decided to leave she told her family she was going to Hitchick home and left the apartment at around 8 p.m. Lab's sister walked with her for less than a mile from the apartment to about 513 Andover Street in Lawrence, where Lab told her sister to go back to their mother's home, and Lab started to Hitchick home to Lowell, something that wasn't unusual at that time. The following morning, after Lab failed to return home, Mixon and her mother, who has since died, reported her as a missing person. Her father, Roland Lab, who continued to live in Balerica for a number of years after his daughter's disappearance, maintained contact with Balerica police over the years. At the time she went missing, Lab was described as 5 feet, 5 inches tall, 120 pounds, with brown hair, green eyes, fair complexion. She was last seen wearing a white blouse and blue dungarees. Roland and Louise Lab lived in Balerica for years raising their children. Both parents worked at the Concord Shores restaurant, Roland working as a bartender and Louise as a hostess. Their daughter attended Locke Middle School in Balerica from 1968 to 1970, West said. She grew up on Intervale Street, across the road from Mixon's family. Mixon said they were friends growing up, then after he returned from a stint in the U.S. Army, they became more than that. She was a lot of fun, Mixon said, but Lab also had an adventurous side. Six months before she disappeared, Lab took off to live with a singer in a rock band in Pennsylvania. About a month later, Lab called Mixon and wanted to come home. He said she sometimes traveled with a rough crowd. This whole disappearance wasn't shocking at first, he said. Initially, her case was treated as a runaway. It took a while before it sunk in that something was really wrong, he said. But as time passed with no word, not even a call to her mother, which Mixon said was unusual, he began to fear the worst. Mixon and Lab's family scoured the root home, but to no avail. After 40 years, Mixon said it is hard to believe in a happy ending, but there is always hope. Anyone with information can contact the Balerica Police Department or NCMEC. Number 5 Catherine was last seen riding her Murray bicycle in her hometown of Stowe, Massachusetts. She headed to her part-time job as a supermarket cashier at the IGA store two miles away, on Route 62 in Hudson, Massachusetts. She was reportedly in good spirits, her brother had just graduated high school, and there was going to be a celebration later. She has never been heard from again. Catherine's case was first classified as a runaway, but authorities later admitted that she had probably not left of her own accord. She left her first paycheck behind at her workplace. Her family never believed she ran away. Her bicycle was located in 1987, nearly two years after her disappearance. A motorist located the bicycle in a wooded area along Gleasondale Road off of Route 62, about 500 yards past the Stowe Town line. The man did not know whose bicycle it was and gave it to a friend, who suspected it belonged to Catherine and contacted police. Searches of the location were delayed several times due to inclement weather, and no evidence related to Catherine's whereabouts was discovered. Authorities believe Catherine's case may be connected to the 1985 abduction and murder of Sarah Pryor, who vanished from the same Massachusetts area two months after Catherine's disappearance. John Robert Wordy has been considered the prime suspect in both girls' cases. He served 17 months in a Texas prison for the 1967 murder of a 15-year-old girl. After being released from prison he moved to Massachusetts. Records from Wordy's job place him in the area at the time Catherine disappeared, but there has never been any evidence to link him to her or Pryor's case. Wordy is currently incarcerated in Texas for parole violation, which stems from the kidnapping and assault of a Newton, Massachusetts woman, which occurred three months after Catherine's disappearance and one month after Pryor's murder. Foul play is suspected in Catherine's case due to the circumstances involved. Seven years after her disappearance, her family held a memorial service for her and erected a tombstone at the family burial plot in Dover, New Hampshire. Number 6
Everyone likes to have a little fun once in a while, especially when you're in your teens. For Melanie Mielinson on Woburn, enjoying a party on October 27, 1989 was most likely something she looked forward to. Unfortunately, a night of fun turned into a mystery that has lasted 31 years. Melanie was a young pretty freshman at Woburn High School and in 1989 was looking forward to transferring to Northeast Vocational High School, the removal of her braces and her upcoming 15th birthday. She had a tumultuous home life at first her parents struggled with alcohol issues, so she was raised by her loving grandmother and aunts while retaining contact with her parents. Because of her sometimes unstable home life with her parents, Melanie had run away in the past but had always kept contact with her family to ease their minds. During the day of October 27, Melanie and a friend left school earlier than normal, and that evening, her grandmother reported that Melanie told her she was going to have a sleepover next door at that same friend's house. Unfortunately, this was not true instead of a sleepover, Melanie put forth the story as a cover to her true intentions of attending a party. Melanie had planned to go with her friend, but she was unable to go out of fear of breaking curfew, so Melanie had planned to simply sneak out and wake her friend up upon her return by throwing rocks at her window to be let in. For many a freshman, getting invited to a party with older teens is an exciting rite of passage, no doubt the 14-year-old Melanie was equally as honored to have received an invitation to attend. The party, which was ripe with illegal underage drinking, was in a popular high school kids' meeting place in the woods on the outskirts of town behind Henshaw Street Industrial Park on the Winchester-Stoneham line, and Melanie was reported by partygoers to have walked or stood down a path with a few older boys. That, unfortunately, was the last time she was ever seen alive. On October 28, after her family realized that she had been at the party, they contacted partygoers for answers receiving none before reporting her missing. Conflicting reports about her last sighting were reported to the cops by various partygoers, and each one claimed that the other was the last to see Melanie. Eventually, it was concluded that Melanie had been in the presence of two boys of note at the party, but the police never found any concrete evidence against either of them to be charged with a crime. Officers at first considered the possibility that she ran away from home because of her past tendencies to do so, but her grandmother reported that she hadn't brought any clothing or belongings with her and had never indicated her intent to run away. Furthermore, her family and friends never heard from her again after that night. Eventually, investigators came to believe that Melanie was a victim of something sinister. In 1992, an anonymous caller told police that they should search a pond near where the party took place that night, but nothing was found in the subsequent search of the area. In 2009, investigators renewed interest in the cold case, offering $50,000 reward for information to solve it. Unfortunately, the reward remains unclaimed. Cadaver dogs and new methods like the decomposition odor analysis have been used to try and locate the girl's body, but nothing has ever been found. Since 1989, Melanie's parents and grandmother have passed away without ever knowing what happened to her, but hopefully someday, someone who was there at the party that night will open up about what they did or didn't see. Number 7 Angelo was last seen at the Higgins Memorial Swimming Pool, a public pool approximately 100 yards from his family's home near their home at the Stadium Housing Projects on East Dalton Street in Lawrence, Massachusetts on August 21, 1976. His mother told investigators that he called home at about 3.30 p.m. that day and spoke to one of his brothers, Angelo gave no indication that anything was wrong at the time. A lifeguard at the pool reported that he saw Angelo walking around the area at approximately 5.45 p.m., that was the last time anyone has seen him. Investigators initially believed Angelo was a runaway. He was the product of a broken home, and they speculated that he might have felt torn between his parents. Foul play is now suspected in Angelo's disappearance. His parents were both considered suspects in his case and have not officially been removed from the list of possible offenders, but investigators doubt either one was involved in his disappearance. One suspect in Angelo's disappearance is Charles Pierce, who was a resident of Haverhill, Massachusetts in 1976. A photo of Pierce is posted with this case summary. He confessed to two abductions that occurred in the 1970s. One was the case of Janice Pocket, a girl who disappeared from Connecticut in 1973, and another case involving an unidentified boy from Lawrence, Massachusetts. It's believed that Pierce was referring to Angelo's case by that description. He claimed that he sexually assaulted and buried the unidentified boy in a grave near Janice's, neither body has been discovered. Pierce was familiar with the Lawrence area and was a suspect in more than a dozen children's disappearances from the 1950s through the 1970s in New England. 
he was convicted of a Massachusetts murder and was serving a 20-year prison term when he died in 1999. Another suspect in Angelo's case is Wayne W. Chapman, a Providence, Rhode Island native who may have been a pedophile associate of Pierce. Chapman was arrested in Waterloo, New York in September 1976 while driving a converted van that had once been a blue delivery truck. Chapman's vehicle closely resembled the description of a van one of Angelo's friends observed near the pool area where Angelo was last seen. Photos of Chapman and his vehicle are posted with this case summary. A witness told authorities that he and another boy found a large pit in the woods near the pool, the friend stated that the hole could have been large enough to hold a child's body. When he returned to the area a few days later, the pit had been filled in. This spot has never been proven to be a gravesite. Investigators also found child pornography materials, a starter pistol and a sock which appeared to be bloodstained in Chapman's van. The sock was eventually lost, and it was never proven whether the substance on it was blood. Chapman was later convicted of the 1975 rapes of two boys, he lured both boys from the same swimming pool Angelo would later vanish from. Rhode Island police have a letter stating that Chapman was working in that state at the time of Angelo's disappearance. Chapman has never been charged in connection with Angelo's case. He served his prison sentence and was civilly committed as a sexually dangerous offender, but he was released in 2019. He is in his 70s and has Parkinson's disease, and after his release, he sent to a Boston medical facility, although his sex offender registration lists him as homeless. Angelo's childhood friend, Melanie Perkins, produced a documentary about his case entitled Have You Seen Andy? Two excavations near Lawrence in 1999 failed to locate Angelo's remains. His case remains open and unsolved.